Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the gr special GRIPS Forum on Building a Free and Open Indo-Pacific, a debate before the G7 Summit in Hiroshima, co-hosted by the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, and the PHP Research Institute. I'm Narushige Michita, Executive Vice President at GRIPS, and I'll be serving as your host today. Unfortunately, the situation in the Indo-Pacific region is not easy. North Korea is launching missiles, and China is strengthening its military capabilities. What can we do to cope with those challenges and maintain peace and stability in this region? How should the countries in this region cooperate to create a free and open Indo-Pacific? Today, we have invited three renowned specialists from Australia, Japan, and the United States to answer those questions. We will do three things today. First, I will invite uh, GRIPS President Hiroko Ota to make opening remarks. Second, I will ask specialists uh, to make uh, uh, from uh, Australia and the United States to make uh, keynote speeches. And finally, specialists from Australia, Japan, and the United States uh, and I will be sitting together to discuss how to build a free and open Indo-Pacific. First, let me invite President Ota. Distinguished guests, audience members, and the online viewers, welcome to a special edition of the GRIPS Forum. My name is Hiroko Ota, and I am the president of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. The Indo-Pacific region has emerged as one of the key strategic arena in the world, and the need to build a free and open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP, has become more urgent than ever before. This forum provides a platform for us to exchange ideas and insight on this critical issue ahead of the G7 summit that will be held in Hiroshima this May. In September last year, I attended the funeral of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe with heavy heart. Amid the silence at the Nippon Budokan, a holy site for traditional Japanese martial art, I remembered the strong leadership that Mr. Abe exercised during his lifetime. Shortly after my appointment as Minister of State for Economic and Fiscal Policy in his cabinet in 2006, I asked him which policy should be tackled first among the many issues at hand. Without hesitation, he responded, let's start with the most difficult policy. I had previously considered him to be a soft-spoken person, but at that moment, I witnessed his unwavering determination and passion without fear of friction. Mr. Abe's strong leadership was most visible in the security and foreign policy arena. As we all know, it was he who formulated and implemented the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. In 2016, he presented the vision at the Ticket 6, or the 6th Tokyo International Conference on African Development in Nairobi, Kenya. Since then, the United States, France, ASEAN nations, and most recently, South Korea, have officially adopted Mr. Abe's vision and incorporated it into their national strategies. In the meantime, GRIPS 
took an important initiative to contribute to the FOIP vision. In 2015, we created a new one-year master's degree program called Maritime Safety and Security Policy Program, or MSP program, at our school in close cooperation with the Japan Coast Guard and JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. In the MSP program, we bring together up to 10 Coast Guard office officers from countries in the Indo-Pacific region to study international affairs, maritime security, operations, and policy making. Let me introduce our student currently studying in the MSP program. MSP student, please rise. Thank you. Please be seated. Every year, ESP students study in Tokyo from October to March, and in Hiroshima from April to July. So this year's cohort has the fortune of being in Hiroshima during the G7 summit. Despite our effort, the world is not a perfect place the war is still going on in Ukraine. North Korea continued to develop nuclear weapons and missiles, and the Chinese military strengthened formation across the Taiwan Strait. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has inherited Mr. Abe's strong leadership in foreign policy and security. Japan has a major role to play in a world that could be heading toward confrontation and division. The upcoming G7 summit in Hiroshima present a significant opportunity for the Kishida administration to showcase its unwavering dedication to peace and commitment toward eliminating nuclear weapons through proactive diplomacy. Today, we are here to identify critical issues that the leaders of the G7 summit must address in Hiroshima. Mr. Johnston, Professor Merkaf, Professor Minohara, and the audience and viewers, I look forward to learning from all of you. And I strongly believe that our discussion today will contribute to our joint effort to build a truly free and open Indo-Pacific and a world which is peaceful and prosperous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please uh, excuse President Ota. At this time, she should be in and out today, and she, she should, will be viewing uh, this event online. <laughs> now, let me invite two speakers to make their remarks. The first speaker is Professor Rory Metcalf. Professor Metcalf is the head of National Security College at the Nas Australian National University. He was the founding director of the security program at the prestigious Lowry Institute in Sydney. He was also an early advocate of the Quad uh, Security Partnership and now plays a leading role in informal track to diplomacy uh, with many Indo-Pacific countries including Japan. He's an opinion leader on the Indo-Pacific strategic concept and has written this book entitled Indo-Pacific Empire, China, America, and the Contest for the World's Pivotal Region. If you are interested, please take a look at the book um, I have already. <laughs> and there is actually 
uh, good news is that there is a Japanese version of this book entitled Indo Taiheyo Senryaku no Chiseigaku. So, with that, Rory, the floor is yours. So my distinguished uh, hosts here at GRIPS, and particularly uh, Professor uh, Ota, uh, my, my old friend, uh, Professor Michishita, and thank you for the uh, mention of my book, uh, expert colleagues, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'll talk about the Indo-Pacific, but I want to particularly talk about what I would call the end of the beginning of the Indo-Pacific era. The Indo-Pacific is a place... It's a name, it's an idea, but it's also a wave that has been sweeping global diplomacy. The concept of the Indo-Pacific, in my view, provides what is now an essential and a widely accepted diplomatic framework for managing profound challenges to regional and global security, security broadly defined. The Indo-Pacific is a practical reimagining of the world map to suit the problem of our times, indeed the problems of our times. It reframes an Asia-centric region to reflect growing connectivity and contest across two oceans, driven in substantial part by China's expanding interests and influence. Now this vision of the Indo-Pacific is useful to many nations because it explains and encourages the dilution and the balancing of Chinese power through an array of new partnerships across collapsed geographic boundaries. And I would point, for example, to the Australia-India relationship where we've made some real breakthroughs this week. When you see footage of an Australian Prime Minister on an Indian aircraft carrier, you know that the world has changed and become more Indo-Pacific. So we have through the Indo-Pacific a metaphor for collective action, a code for a pivotal region where China can and should be prominent but not dominant. In a global discourse that's often been dominated by Beijing's transgressions and triumphalism or by simplistic narratives that everything is about US-China bipolarity, the Indo-Pacific offers an alternative. It's about steadiness and solidarity among many nations. Now, in my view, and this speech is not all about China, but just bear with me for a moment, uh, the Indo-Pacific is not a plot to exclude or contain China. It's actually about offering the choice of incorporating a powerful China into a regional order where the rights of others are respected and to actively counterbalance that power when those rights are not respected. After all, it has been the growth of China's own wealth, power, interests and influence across two oceans. Just think about the Maritime Silk Road, uh, that has been a large but not the only impetus for this Indo-Pacific era. Equally, moving to other problems, other issues, other challenges, the Indo-Pacific is a useful framework to marshal regional responses and indeed global responses to the transnational risks to our shared security and development, whether those risks come from pandemic, from poverty, uh, from the impacts, of course, of climate change, just to name a few. Now, Japan and Australia were two of the earliest and most effective drivers of the Indo-Pacific geopolitical enterprise. Personally, I've supported Australia's Indo-Pacific policy voyage for many years. 2013, a decade ago, was a turning point for us because our Defence White Paper in 2013 was the first official strategy of any nation to redefine our region of geopolitical interest as the Indo-Pacific. And just to give you a brief aside about Australia before we really turn to the subject of the day, to the free and open Indo-Pacific and, and Japan's future choices there, people often ask where's Australia's Indo-Pacific strategy. But in fact there have been many uh, because the Indo-Pacific is woven through all the defence and foreign policy documents that Australian governments have produced over the past 10 years across both sides of our politics. And that encompasses everything from defence and foreign policy through to, for example, development assistance uh, in, in the Pacific. Nonetheless, it is high time, in my view, that an Australian government issued a comprehensive and updated Indo-Pacific strategy, if only to raise awareness of how all these elements are integrated 
and of the fact that Australia has been there from the beginning. However, uh, I'm in Tokyo and it's wonderful to be back in Japan, to be back in Tokyo after too long an absence. And it's especially fitting at this time, on the eve of Japan's hosting the G7 summit, that we acknowledge and we reflect on Japan's early leadership regarding Indo-Pacific diplomacy, and especially Japan's establishment and promotion of the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, this is a vision that began at least as early as 2006, 2007, when the late Abe Shinzo's first government articulated an arc of freedom and prosperity to include Indian Ocean partners, and when Prime Minister Abe himself spoke persuasively of the confluence of the two seas in the Indian Parliament. Now, this resonated with the origins of the Quad and the idea of the democratic security diamond, but it's important to realise that Japanese thinking about the Indo-Pacific has never been in purely exclusive or purely security terms. As Professor Ota has noted, in 2016 in Nairobi, uh, Kenya, Japanese diplomacy unveiled the free and open Indo-Pacific with a welcome focus on development and connectivity across two oceans, reaching to Africa and looking generations into the future. And so the free and open version of the Indo-Pacific has never simply been a code for balancing China. Instead, it has a maritime fluidity, if I can say that, and a philosophically Asian duality. That is, it's about incorporating the interests of the many while marshalling the capabilities of the willing. And even though many other nations have chosen their adjectives a little differently, often adding terms such as stable or in some cases uh, inclusive or prosperous, there's no question that Japan's FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, has influenced the policies of many others, including and most especially the United States of America. There should be no embarrassment, uh, I think, from an American perspective in recognising that there's been a degree of followership, or at least a consultative form of leadership, in the way Washington has gone Indo-Pacific in recent years, and much of that owes to the vision, the skill and the persistence of Japanese diplomacy. Under the late Prime Minister Abe, but also sustained very effectively by his successors. Indo-Pacific strategy has been a vital pillar of continuity between the foreign and defence policies of Republicans and Democrats in the United States in recent years. And it's good to see the Biden administration taking a more comprehensive approach that recognises economics, technology, development, information and public goods as integral alongside deterrence. The United States has more to go in this direction, but perhaps we'll hear about that presently. Now, we all know that success has many authors, and the Indo-Pacific idea has benefited from a diversity of champions. Importantly, as well as Japan and Australia, the United States and India, of course. But I want to mention the initiative of Indonesia in shaping the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, because that, in 2019, was another crucial turning point, a turning point in legitimising and encouraging a much wider array of Indo-Pacific friends, and converts, especially in Europe. So in the past few years, the Indo-Pacific tide has spread to the EU, Germany, Britain, the Netherlands, Canada, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea. The French will say they already were kind of getting it. Um, even small nations in the Pacific are, be are becoming, in my view, more comfortable with this formulation. Perhaps not in love with the formulation, but more comfortable with the formulation because they're beginning to realise that it empowers rather than marginalises maritime nations. Critics of the Indo-Pacific, and to be fair, they are not only confined to the Chinese propaganda machine, argue that different nations profess different Indo-Pacific visions and that that is somehow a point of weakness. Yet I think that in actual fact there is a refreshing quality and quantity of convergence among the many national and institutional visions of the Indo-Pacific that are out there. For example, uh, the 2019 ASEAN outlook focuses on connectivity and development, and it lists more than 14 principles, including, unsurprisingly, ASEAN centrality, but also openness, inclusivity, rules, mutual respect, and a renunciation of the threat or use of force. 
if you did the diplomatic equivalent of a, a blind taste test, superimposing the ASEAN outlook on recent Quad communiques, it would become quite hard, in fact, to tell them apart. And there are some profound observations that all Indo-Pacific visions seem to reflect. This is a region defined by connectivity and contestation across two oceans, defined by the emerging global centre of gravity, economically, demographically and strategically. The Indo-Pacific is the emerging global centre of gravity. The region is defined by its multipolar and maritime character, and it's a region with Southeast Asia at the core, with maritime Southeast Asia in particular at the core, but also that acknowledgement of ASEAN centrality in the diplomatic architecture of the region. In fact, the only really significant nations that remain unhappy with the Indo-Pacific seem to be China and Russia. In 2019, China's then Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, famously claimed that the Indo-Pacific and the Quad were attention-gathering ideas that would dissipate like ocean foam. Now, he may not have his job anymore, but the Indo-Pacific remains well-employed and in great demand. In fact, the Indo-Pacific idea has sailed through the storms of the past few years. COVID-19, wolf warrior diplomacy, maritime tensions, the global catastrophe of Russia's criminal invasion of Ukraine, and the Indo-Pacific has emerged from those storms as an idea tempered and true, an idea whose time has come. So where do we go from here? Well, the last thing that Indo-Pacific champions need to do now is to pause. The momentum is there, but it must be sustained. We're at the end of the beginning of the Indo-Pacific idea. We need to look ahead. So the intellectual and diplomatic movement to embed the Indo-Pacific as a new orthodoxy, one that fits the challenges, the complexities, the connectivities, the contests of our time, has been a success and quite a rapid one. After all, it took many years for the Asia-Pacific idea to take root from the 1970s to the 1990s. But the demands of statecraft and the perils of our strategic environment, the uncertainty complex of the 2020s, as, as the UNDP calls it, allow no time for rest or intellectual pause. To paraphrase Marx, if I can do that here, the point is not to understand the world, but to influence it. And that means both preservation and change. When it comes to a free and open Indo-Pacific, or indeed a free, open, prosperous, stable and inclusive Indo-Pacific, the right objective for strategy, in my view, is both to uphold and to build. We can't simply play an insecure and defensive game of protecting the rules and institutions we have. We also need to build, shape, adapt, engage and act. And that gives some insight into avenues for where we may go next. We need to accentuate the convergence of Indo-Pacific visions, not only among Quad countries, but more widely. We need to focus on principles and interests, on commonalities between our national visions that go beyond liberal democracy and beyond national security. And I say that as someone who personally firmly believes in democracy and the importance of national security, but the convergent interests of the Indo-Pacific are broader still. We should think about Indo-Pacific convergence through what my book, and thank you again, Michi, for, for the reference to it, what my book defines as five pillars of coexistence in this Indo-Pacific era. Development, diplomacy, deterrence, resilience, and solidarity. So let's look at convergence, but let's also look at translating it into practical ideas to operationalise Indo-Pacific strategy. These need to include options across a broad landscape of economics, development, sustainability, technology, as well as defence and security. And so, for example, when we look at national security and defence strategies of countries that have championed Indo-Pacific ideas, whether it's Japan or Australia, Quad members uh, or, or partners further afield, we need to look at how to translate and indeed deploy our evolving defence capabilities in ways that support shared Indo-Pacific stability, shared Indo-Pacific strategy. And that need not only be in the context of the US alliance system, although, of course, that provides an essential glue, the alliance system, the minilaterals, the trilaterals, and beyond. 
And this point, of course, applies as Japan undertakes the very significant growth and modernisation of its defence capabilities in the years ahead. We need to look also beyond uh, security, as I said, beyond defence. And so I think it's time for a more comprehensive evolution of Indo-Pacific policy to look at matters of connectivity, the, matters, the issues that matter so much to our friends in Southeast Asia, and to look at ways in which we can develop shared regional standards, regional standards for infrastructure, regional standards for investment, regional standards based on trust and based on quality. And to look at where, I guess, this may um, merge or intersect with existing or growing institutions, uh, whether it's the uh, uh, CPTPP or whether it's other uh, regional endeavours, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or where, in fact, we may need to build new minilateral arrangements to encourage those standards. Ideally, we want to look for ways where mechanisms can join, where the Quad, for example, and ASEAN can have a conversation about connectivity and standards. Not a conversation necessarily about hard security or issues where the ASEAN consensus may be uncomfortable, but issues to do with the development and the resilience of the region. I think it's also worth thinking again about how to connect both Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific uh, approach, its strategy as it evolves, with the growing interest of other nations in the Indo-Pacific. As I've said, many countries have adopted Indo-Pacific visions, uh, notably the Europeans. And I think the challenge there is to help Europeans understand how this is a theatre not only of economic dynamism, but of strategic tension and rivalry. Uh, and that there are connections that we can't escape between what's happening in Europe, including Russia's aggression. So developing approaches that involve uh, a franker sharing of views, a greater convergence of interests with European partners in the security as well as the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. That's another piece of the puzzle. And that security does not need to mean frontline naval deployment. It can be issues like cyber security, for example, protection of critical infrastructure, or building resilience in nations that have been subject to coercion or um, other forms of influence. And then finally, looking for new partners in the region as well. Uh, positive signs such as the way that the Republic of Korea is looking now to an Indo-Pacific policy uh, point to uh, significant potential for expanding uh, the range of partnerships that established members of the Quad or uh, other US allies and partners have on the Indo-Pacific. I'm going to conclude with um, a couple of thoughts about some of the approaches that I think Australia is taking, again, to look at the potential for convergence with the evolution of Japan's own strategies and policies on the Indo-Pacific. There's a concept that uh, the Australian Foreign Minister has very uh, frequently and actively promoted in recent months since her Labor government came to power in Australia. The Australian Foreign Minister, Penny Wong, speaks about strategic equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific. And this is a term worth unpacking. It's a concept that I think is being developed as a basis for Australian policy and strategy at the moment. And there could well be points of traction, points of intersection with thinking in Japan and beyond. And the way I see strategic equilibrium as a foundation for policy is that, again, this is an idea that uh, recognises the duality of the Indo-Pacific, the duality of a region that's defined by connectivity and contest at the same time. Strategic equilibrium is about balance. It's about balance of power in the Indo-Pacific. It's about ensuring that deterrence is there and deterrence works. And that, of course, is one of the key reasons, in fact, the key reason for Australia's own decision to strengthen its defences through the, uh, the AUKUS submarine partnership uh, in recent times. But strategic equilibrium is also about ensuring that deterrence is stable and stabilising, in a sense, that there is uh, diplomatic scaffolding, that there is clear communication and clear channels of regional engagement to ensure that as we build and maintain this balance of power, we're also keeping crises under control, reducing temptations for adventurism, avoiding miscalculation. And some of that is through uh, regular, comprehensive, integrated dialogue with nations that are not necessarily aligned with us uh, in full, including in Southeast Asia. Some of that is also related to ensuring 
that the day-to-day behaviour of military and paramilitary and auxiliary forces at sea or in the air uh, is predictable, manageable, stable. And that goes, of course, for example, to relations between Japan and China, relations across the Taiwan Strait, relations in the South China Sea, indeed Australia's own uh, maritime behaviour. That's an area where I think there's, again, an enormous amount of work to be done and potential for our countries to, to work together, share their expertise and their interests. And I would, on that note, applaud uh, the work that GRIPS is doing in building um, uh, an experienced, educated maritime security cohort uh, here in Tokyo. I'm going to pause there and thank you for your time and attention and wish our friends in Japan well on the next stage of their Indo-Pacific voyage. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, now the second speaker we have today is Mr. Christopher Johnstone. Mr. Johnstone is Senior Advisor and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, based in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining CSIS, Mr. Johnstone uh, served in the U.S. government for 25 years in a variety of senior positions with a focus on U.S. policy toward Japan and the Indo-Pacific. He served twice on the uh, National Security Council as director for East Asia under President Biden and director for Japan and Ocean uh, Ocean Oceanian Affairs under President Obama. In the office of the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Johnstone led offices with responsibility for South and Southeast Asia and East Asia. He was director for Northeast Asia for, from 2010 to 2014, where he had principal responsibility for developing strategy for the US-Japan alliance. With that, Chris, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to be here, to be at GRIPS for the first time, actually, to see my good friend Michishita Sensei. Uh, and thank you to uh, Ota Sensei for, for convening this great event today. Um, I thought Professor Metcalf's uh, remarks were really terrific in setting uh, a frame for us to think about the free and open Indo-Pacific. And I think what I'm going to try to do here uh, over the next 20 minutes or so is take us down a little. Um, I thought I would try to provide you with a bit of a stock taking about how the American um, perspective is on a free and open Indo-Pacific, how uh, two administrations have approached it, uh, assess some of its um, strengths and weaknesses, uh, and then I'll close with a few points about U.S.-China relations, which of course are very much in the backdrop of, of the American strategy, but I think more broadly uh, the discussion we're having here today about uh, FOIP. Uh, so, so the first point to make is that the term free and open Indo-Pacific, just as Professor Metcalf said, is a concept that the United States has embraced and adopted uh, and recognizes that its origin is in Japan. And the United States, building from uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, uh, has designed a strategy to advance, to achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, it was the Trump administration, actually, that made, first made the conscious decision to use the language free and open Indo-Pacific. And the Biden administration, after an initial review, made the conscious decision to continue using that language. This is actually rather remarkable in the United States. Uh, if you know anything about the way we work, you know that uh, a new administration tends to come in, uh, take an existing concept or idea, give it a new name, uh, and then take credit for it. But that is not 
uh, what, uh, uh, what the Biden administration did. Um, and I think it's a real statement of respect uh, for the leadership of former Prime Minister Abe uh, in Japan. Um, so for the United States, the meaning and the objectives of a free and open Indo-Pacific are articulated in a strategy that the United States issued just about exactly uh, a year ago, uh, a year ago while Secretary Blinken was in Fiji. This is the first time uh, that the White House has had a regional strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and, and somewhat strangely, it was actually the first strategic document that this administration released, ahead of our national level documents on the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. It was our Indo-Pacific strategy uh, that came out first. And I think that too reflects the priority uh, that, that is placed on, on this part of the world. Second point to make up front, and I think this is true for Japan, Australia, others who embrace this concept, is that the free and open Indo-Pacific is intended to be an affirmative, a positive vision of the region, an affirmation of what the United States stands for and not what the United States stands against. In other words, it's a message that's intended to have broad appeal uh, and to attract support. Of course, China's challenge to the United States uh, is very much in the background, but, he, but there is actually very little mention of terms like great power competition uh, that do appear in our national security strategy and national defense strategy. They do not in the Indo-Pacific strategy. In fact, the US Indo-Pacific strategy actually says very little about China. In a 19-page document, uh, China appears in just two paragraphs uh, at the beginning. So the intent is to be positive uh, and forward-looking. So from an American perspective, in practical terms, uh, what is the free and open Indo-Pacific and how do we intend to achieve it? The American strategy begins with an articulation of the key principles that should form the foundation of such uh, a concept. Uh, the freedom of all states to make sovereign choices without coercion, consistent with international law. The idea that all states, big or small, have the same basic rights. The idea that shared domains, the maritime domain, the space domain, the cyber domain, must be governed by international law and not by raw power. The air, the air and maritime spaces in particular must be governed by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. The idea that there should be common shared approaches to new technologies that pose unique challenges to sovereignty and governance. The cyberspace, the internet, artificial intelligence. And from the American point of view, uh, a, free, a free and open Indo-Pacific is characterized by the basic values of good governance, democratic institutions, a free press, transparency, uh, and efforts to fight corruption, the accountability of governments to their people. These are the essential features of a free and open Indo-Pacific uh, from the American perspective. So then how do we go about achieving these goals to get to the meat of the strategy? The American approach sets out basically four, four approaches. First is strengthening connections within and beyond the region. Professor Metcalf mentioned this, this idea of a lattice work, a mesh of, of coalitions, no single overarching organization or framework, but some old, some new, new groupings working together to achieve uh, common ends. For the United States, of course, this starts with our treaty allies uh, and ex an acceleration of the movement away from the traditional hub and spoke approach to our alliances toward more interconnected partnerships. And that, as, that is, in fact, what we're seeing as we think about Japan's ever-tightening relationship with Australia, deepening ties with the Republic of Korea, uh, and more recently, the Philippines. Also at the core is, of course, a strong and unified ASEAN at the heart of the region's institutional order, the continuing importance of institutions like the East Asia Summit, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. Uh, but there's also an emphasis on building new structures, in particular the Quad, 
uh, this administration has placed a particular emphasis on building the Quad into an enduring feature of the region's institutional architecture with India as a critical player in the Indo-Pacific. And the Quad is a body that can make unique, positive contributions to the region in areas such as global health, climate, technology, and clean infrastructure. There are other minilateral, what we call minilateral uh, structures that are emerging as well. Uh, the Japan, US, Australia trilateral arrangement, AUKUS of course, uh, and then efforts to build ties with organizations outside the region. Uh, and here we're speaking of um, in the deeper engagement between the Indo-Pacific uh, and, and Europe. The theme behind all of this, right? Thank you. The theme behind all of this is that the rules-based order is indivisible. Uh, and voices outside the region and anywhere within it have a role to play in articulating uh, the future. A second component of the, of the U.S. approach is a focus on prosperity, advancing common prosperity, uh, a new economic framework to help regional economies harness technological transformation. I'll have more to say about this later, but the centerpiece of the administration's approach has been the Indo-Pacific economic framework. A third is security, promoting security, extending and modernizing the U.S. security role in the region. Some of you may have heard the term integrated deterrence. It encompasses a lot of things, uh, but it places a heavy emphasis in particular for the United States on allies. And not just about uh, uh, expressing our support for allies, but actually empowering allies in ways that, that, that the United States perhaps hasn't before. A great example of this is the AUKUS effort to support Australia's military modernization and acquisition of submarines in particular, but also the very explicit support from Washington uh, for, for Japan's military modernization and the steps that were announced in, uh, in December. The idea behind this is that strong allies are good for deterrence, good for stability, and good for advancing the cause of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And finally, there's a, there's a line of effort focused on resilience, supporting the region's capacity to deal with transnational threats pandemics, climate change, et cetera. So how is the administration done? How successful have they been in this approach? In my judgment, I think by any measure, the record is strong on the effort to build connections within and beyond the region uh, and to strengthen the security posture in the region. There's been a heavy level of engagement of, with ASEAN the first ever uh, meeting of leaders of ASEAN at the White House last year, multiple visits by uh, senior officials to the region, uh, and a recommitment of the United States to ASEAN's core, uh, core institutions. There's been, as I said before, an institutionalization of the Quad. The Quad will have its third year at the leader level um, just in a few weeks, with Australia hosting the third leaders, the third, the third leaders meeting. There's been a launch of a new mechanism focused on the Pacific Islands, the Partners for the Blue Pacific, to deepen engagement uh, among a number of partners in this critical part of the region, which has been, frankly, long neglected by U.S. policy. Uh, and as I said, there has been expanded engagement with, uh, with Europe uh, in the context of, of NATO and other organizations. So from a security standpoint, I and from a connectivity standpoint, I think by any measure, uh, the record is strong for the United States. The major glaring weakness uh, is on the economic front, where ever since the United States pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership under the Trump administration, there has been essentially no effective uh, level of, of comprehensive economic engagement in, in the region. The IPEF has some interesting components to it, but is no substitute for an agenda focused on expanding market access uh, and, and uh, according more benefit of access to the U.S. market, particularly to developing economies uh, in East Asia. This is deeply unfortunate uh, because as strong as the U.S. security commitment is, uh, what the developing parts of the Indo-Pacific seek most is economic engagement from the United States. 
therefore, Japan's role, as we think about the role that Japan plays, Japan's role in this area will continue to be vital. This is where complementary approaches to a free and open Indo-Pacific are critical, where like-minded partners can leverage their comparative advantages and work together to achieve common goals. Japan and other leading economies will continue to be critical in leading the economic dimensions of the free and open Indo-Pacific, offering a better alternative to the economic carrots China offers and a response to the coercion that it sometimes demonstrates. Let me close with a few points on the US-China relationship because I think there are implications here for advancing the free and open Indo-Pacific concept. Simply put, this is a relationship that is likely to be deeply challenging for the foreseeable future. The Biden administration's national security strategy focuses on addressing the challenge posed by China, describing it as, quote, the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the power to advance that objective. This perspective is broadly shared in Washington across both political parties. There's a strong consensus in the United States that strategic competition with China is the central challenge confronting the United States. And this is, frankly, not all that new. The shift in US mainstream thinking on the relationship with China began at the end of the Obama administration. It accelerated dramatically under President Trump and has further intensified under the Biden administration which has developed new tools to advance the competition. The bipartisan consensus in the United States on China policy is now firm, uh, and it is here to stay. And this competition with China has brought it into new areas, in particular technology competition. In October last year, for example, the administration announced dramatic new controls on the export of semiconductors and related technology effectively targeted decoupling from the Chinese economy. We can expect action to control technology flows in other areas with implications for national security as well, such as biotechnology, quantum computing, and clean energy technology. And like the semiconductor announcement, the United States will seek to cooperate with like-minded partners, like Japan, to take a similar approach the role of allies and partners will be critical in making such approaches uh, to the relationship effective. This is perhaps the key issue for the future of the United States and Japan and other like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific. In the trade and investment relationship with China, where should we place the boundary between economic interdependence and coupling and decoupling? So while the US Indo-Pacific strategy and the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific seeks to focus on a positive affirmative vision and to downplay strategic competition with China, the reality is that like-minded partners will of course be directly impacted by this competition and at times will be asked to join uh, in some of the dimensions of the US approach. But I'll stop back where I started. There is much in common in the Indo-Pacific strategies of Japan, the United States, Australia, and other partners. Key is to continue demonstrating the benefits of a common approach and why a free and open Indo-Pacific is truly worth pursuing. And I'll stop there and look forward to, uh, to a discussion. All right, uh, let's get started. Um, to start off uh, with, um, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Tosh Minohara to make some remarks. Uh, Dr. Minohara is Professor of International Relations and Security Studies at Kobe University in the Western Japan, and is the founder and chairman of the Cabinet Office recognized nonprofit organization Research Institute for Indo-Pacific Affairs, RIPA. He also teaches at the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force Staff College and has extensively written on US-Japan relationship. 
Tosh, would you like to share your views on what's going yes. on in this region and uh, what we might have to do to create a free sure. and open okay. Indo-Pacific? Well, thank you very much, Michi, uh, for the introduction. And I must start off by saying that I'm very honored to be part of this panel with two uh, eminent experts. Uh, and uh, of course, I am the side dish to this entire show, but I'd like to give my uh, my view of what FOIP uh, should endeavor and what should the aims be. But before I launch into that, I'd just would like to say that today is also a day of remembrance if you are Japanese, and especially for those who are in Tokyo, because as we know, as we all know, uh, March 10th, 1945 was one of the most devastating fire bombings that took place in the Pacific theater of the war. Uh, 100,000 people perished in one day. And I raise this because as we look at, examine the war that's being fought in Ukraine, the magnitude of these two wars are completely different. It is fought on a different scale uh, completely. And that is where I believe the core of this idea of FOIP should be. It is for to pursue a conflict-free region. And not only that, but also, you know, it's open, exclusive, and stable in the Pacific. And so I think this is the, the core that we should have because, as we all know, uh, outcomes of major wars are, are never good for anybody. And that being said, so uh, we are now in the midst of, we're waiting for uh, Prime Minister Kishida's new uh, FOIP to emerge. And I hope that it will be a FOIP 2.0 rather than a FOIP 1.1. And from my own perspective, what should this new FOIP uh, encompass. And, the, and this Indo-Pacific region is, of course, very large. And I think we all know the figures. It's 65% of the land, land area, 63% of the pop population. It's just a massive area. So how do we make this Indo-Pacific area prosperous, uh, stable, and conflict-free? And one thing that I'd like to raise is, as we look, Japan has many uh, partners uh, across the Pacific, down below with Australia, recently with Britain. Uh, these are all really uh, very important for Japan to have allies. But I also think it's important for Japan to look close. And specifically, I'm referring to South Korea. And recently, this past week, there's been very solid and positive trends for closer bilateral uh, ROK-Japan relations. But I think that uh, when we talk about quad, there is also an inner quad, which I believe should bring in uh, Korea, United States, Japan, and real delicate uh, state of Taiwan. Because these are all like-minded partners. They are very close to Japan. Uh, there is a common history. And so I'd like to see more sort of working uh, along with these partners. Also, part of the inclusivity, uh, FOIP should also engage the Global South. And specifically, I have Africa in mind because Africa has the potential to become the next Asia, the growth, uh, the engine of, for growth uh, for this planet. Uh, and so as we look down south, I mean, these countries do not necessarily uh, share similar ideas at this point. But I, I think we should sort of promote uh, ideals of liberalism, democracy, and to make them under, to, to allow them to understand that they will benefit from sharing these views as well. And next, it's also looking to Europe. I travel to Europe frequently these days. Um, Europe and also NATO is quite interested in the Indo-Pacific. And I think uh, Japan, uh, it's, and I love it when Japan takes initiative in its foreign policy, uh, FOIP being one of them, that Japan should also uh, take advantage of the momentum that it has. It will be, again, hosting G7, and therefore to link more with Europe and NATO from this perspective of security. And the reason why I bring about this idea that Japan take an initiative in expanding FOIP uh, goes because if we look back at the genesis of FOIP, this was in 2016, TICAD 6, it was because of why? It was because of the uncertainty of the new American administration under Trump. Prime Minister Abe was not sure the new direction that President Trump would take. And therefore, in a way, this was Japan's counter. Uh, some people call it, it was Japan was hedging. Uh, well, President Biden is back, the United States is back in course, it's much more predictable. But the question I'd like to leave to you is, so what happens in 2024? 
you know, the, uh, we would like to hope that the United States is here to stay, that it will be a promoter of FOIP, uh, but in the end, it's up to the American voters to decide the course the United States will take. And in the event that it does take a more, uh, it decides to look more inwards, is I think where FOIP will play an important role with the key partners, and these are India, Australia, in the sort of to sort of prod the United States to remain engaged in the region, despite uh, what the new leadership will be. So that being said, so these are just my personal ideas. Um, I'd like to, to launch this discussion with one question to both of the speakers today, and that is, uh, who knows what will be in this new FOIP, but what would you like to see in it is the question, so thank you. Shall I begin? Um, look, thank you, uh, Tosh, and that's, uh, you know, that, that, that not only builds on the, um, the presentations we've just had, but I think it, it gives us a really important reminder of the, um, you know, the principal objectives of, uh, I think, all reasonable Indo-Pacific strategies. It's, it's not only, I mean, it's certainly not only a free and open region, it's, it's, it's a peaceful region, and it's a, peace, it's a region where, uh, where, where, where there's stability, and I guess the idea that um, rules, transparency, openness among the nations of the region is, is one of those pathways. It's a key pathway to peace, is, is worth, worth remembering. But alongside that, of course, does sit deterrence. What, what I think are some reasonable expectations of an evolved Japanese strategy, a, a, a 2.0? Look, I think, firstly, just a reminder that Japan's friends expect Japan to play to its strengths. And, you know, I think we, we've seen some very active, creative, sustained diplomacy over the years, uh, and that's fantastic, and we should see more of that. But Japan remains such a, um, a key part of the regional and global economy. Uh, so economy, technology, private sector, I think sometimes, uh, and indeed uh, development assistance as well, you know, some of these elements get downplayed in the conversation about security, uh, defence and of course Japan now also is is um, doing even more as a defence power as well. But alongside that, looking for ways, I would say if you're looking for uh, expectations on strategy, I think one thing is to um, motivate, leverage, harness the role of the Japanese private sector in the region and globally. I've just come here from uh, Indonesia actually, where many of my conversations were about infrastructure and about development and there are clearly strong traditions of quality Japanese infrastructure in Indonesia, but there, there is a contest for influence on, and, and many of our countries want to provide as many coordinated alternatives to authoritarian powers as we can. So I'd be looking at private sector, I'd be looking at um, regional development, that engagement with the needs of the global south and that, and, that, and that pivot in the global south that we see in Southeast Asia. I think that the, um, the whole development assistance challenge across the region, looking at the Pacific, for example, as well, and how that ties into building communities' resilience, uh, protection of their fisheries, protection of their maritime environment. You know, I think all of this is asking, in aggregate, it's asking too much of Japan as a single power, but of course Australia is going through precisely the same conversations at the moment about how do we evolve our strategy. And so uh, a maximum of coordination, um, deconfliction sometimes, but making the whole greater than the sum of its parts is what I'd be, I would be looking for. And so it's going to be about uh, better engagement with the global south and uh, more diversity, more inclusiveness, right? Chris? I very much second all of uh, Rory's points, really. I mean, I do think Japan has really established itself as a credible regional leader. I mean, if you look at the um, IC's surveys of elite opinion, right, Japan has the highest level of trust uh, across the region of any power, including the United States and China. Um, so that's extraordinarily uh, important uh, influence uh, and a platform for leadership. Uh, and I do think it makes sense to start from Japan's strengths and build out, continue the focus on quality infrastructure, establishing standards for what transparent, clean, uh, quality infrastructure really is. Um, 
lead on issues related to emerging technology, uh, as, I, as I suggested in my remarks. One of the challenges of our time is going to be to, dev to develop uh, common governance procedures related to artificial intelligence. Japan could play a critical role in beginning to build what those norms uh, ought to be and propagating them from, uh, from the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, so I think, I, I do think, starting from, from the, the source of strength uh, makes a lot of sense. The one thing I would note is that Japan's new national security strategy gives it new tools to engage the region, right? Japan traditionally has not been a provider of defense-related assistance in the region. Well, as a result of this strategy uh, and some new tools that are being created, Japan will have more ability to uh, build capacity in the defense and security space. Uh, and so I think it would be positive if, um, if that is also part of FOIP 2.0. Uh, but I do think uh, the, the core strength of Japan is in the economic space, and that's where it should continue to be. Right, thank you very much. So we talked about uh, what Japan has been doing and what Japan should be doing. And uh, let me go back to Australia and the US on FOIP. And Rory talked about uh, the end of the beginning, which means that we are going into the next phase, right? So, uh, and uh, Chris, you talked about uh, creating a mesh, right? And uh, so in this uh, new phase, what would be the two or three things, specific actions or steps that we should be, or uh, Australia and the United States uh, will be taking, in your opinion. Um, I, cannot, I can't pronounce a new prime minister's name easily. Albaginizi. Albany. <laughs> it's, it's hard, just just right? say Albo. Just <laughs> oh, yeah. say Albo, Michi. <laughs> okay, Albo. Prime Minister, Australian Prime Minister Albo's uh, policy, so. Look, I'll, I'll start on that because uh, you know, this is a big time in Australia's own Indo-Pacific engagement and our, and, and our own Indo-Pacific strategy, which I see has often uh, not been articulated in one single public document, but is, is there in, in, in aggregate. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, from an Australian perspective, we are looking at the balancing. I mean, there's no question of that. Um, there's lots of news reports suggesting that there'll be a very clear major capability announcement next week uh, around the, uh, the submarine program, uh, nuclear-powered submarines for Australia under the, the three-nation technology arrangement that, uh, that is labelled AUKUS, but also a uh, profound deepening of Australia-India relations, and that has um, a strong security agenda. And that, of course, sits very neatly with the Quad. But at the same time, uh, there's a deep effort for Australia to engage with and reassure um, countries in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific that uh, what we're looking for here is supporting their resilience and their security. We're not, we're not trying to impose a strategic contest on those countries. There is a strategic contest and we're trying to help them and help the region get through it in that, in that peaceful, stable way uh, that you spoke of. So I think Australia and Japan being uh, in lockstep uh, on that balanced approach to regional diplomacy is important. And Australia and Japan being willing to do as we've done before, uh, and that is the best kind of partners and allies to the United States. In other words, working in building working in building a shared strategy and a comprehensive strategy in the region, which includes the economic dimension, but on those occasions where we feel that the debate in Washington um, has, has gone a little bit far in one direction or another and that, and that America is potentially going to be um, a, a victim of its own, um, its own scale and determination, uh, giving America advice, uh, use, using things like trilaterals and the quads to be uh, the best kinds of friends and allies to the United States and to be occasionally a voice of moderation at times. So I think that's, that's the sort of agenda I see. And just to finish on that note, um, although I've talked about Australia-India um, a lot in the last little while, uh, of course, we've seen extraordinary steps in the Australia-Japan partnership in recent years. Um, you know, the very special uh, agreement, very special uh, security partnership we have with Japan. Uh, so uh, the times have never been better for Australia and Japan to work together. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd cite a few things. First of all, as, as I noted, I think um, the, the economic dimensions of the American approach have been, have fallen short of ideal. Um, so I think a concerted focus on building out the economic toolkit, um, even short of a return to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the administration is exploring ideas, legislative ideas, legal, new legal tools that would allow um, more support related to infrastructure, for example, uh, more support related to climate change resilience, um, uh, more support related to cyber capacity building, for example. Uh, I think these are, would be a very, I think, uh, effective and positive um, uh, areas to focus. Um, uh, on the security front, I mean, I think the, uh, I, I think a, a, a philosophy that's useful is um, helping partners in the region to defend their own sovereignty. So there's an effort underway inside the Quad, for example, to uh, promote um, maritime domain awareness capabilities uh, to countries in the, the Indian Ocean, in Southeast Asia, uh, and, in the, and in the Pacific, and to help connect those efforts so that there's interoperability between them. I think the idea of helping countries to defend their sovereign, sovereignty through certain kinds of targeted capabilities, uh, very sensible approach that, that, uh, that gains, um, uh, gains a lot of support. Um, and then the other area that I would say, uh, lastly, is a focus on young people. You know, one of the, um, I think, really interesting uh, initiatives under the Quad is this, the Quad Fellowship Program right, to, to sort of give uh, opportunities in STEM education to, uh, to, to countries across Southeast Asia and the, and the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think a focus on, on uh, supporting the, the intellectual development and the development of skills of young people would be terrific. Mitchie, can I just jump in there and reinforce that point? Uh, I know you want a debate, and I'm sure we'll disagree on a few things in a moment, but I, I, I heartily endorse that point about education. We are in an educational institution right here in this building and I lead an educational institution in my home country so I guess there's a vested interest there. Uh, but if there's one message I hear consistently in the region, in the Southeast Asia, in the Pacific in particular, and, and, and I think in, in India as well, it's that need, that need to provide the knowledge, the skills, the opportunities for youth. And, you know, again, we're playing to a strength here. I mean, uh, the education offerings in, um, in Australia, in Japan and the United States, you know, are incredibly well regarded around the world and I meet plenty of bright, energetic young people in the region who, if they have a choice to undertake education that can be provided by one or more of our countries or sort of take the easy scholarships to Beijing, you know which choice they're going to make. So we need to make sure that um, they, they have those options there and that it's not only in the, the high-end academic space, but it's also in, for example, vocational and technical education uh, for the workforce. Great. That kind of uh, value added, adding a soft power approach would be great. And, but at the same time, we have to talk about hard power, That's right? Um, Rory talked about balancing, Chris talked about the uh, importance of enhancing um, capabilities for the countries in this region to defend themselves and defend their sovereignty. So let me go back to Tosh. Um, Japan has uh, undertaken a major change in its uh, security policy, defense policy, and it is talking about uh, supposedly doubling <laughs> the defense budget, uh, introducing strike capabilities. So in your opinion, what are the, uh, would be the kind of uh, positive consequences that this uh, new policy will be producing and what are the challenges that we, you know, Japan will be facing in undertaking this um, new venture and what, what are you talking to, you know, what are you uh, telling uh, the, um, you know, maritime self-defense force officers to do in this regard? Yeah, thank you for an excellent question. And you're right. I mean, Japanese security policy is going, uh, you know, it's undergoing a paradigm shift. And I think finally we can say uh, in very, very definite terms that Japan is departing from the so-called Yoshida doctrine. Uh, and it's been a long time we've been saying that, but now with these policies being implemented, 
uh, it is definitely a departure. Uh, and, and it's great that Prime Minister Kishida is taking the leadership and making such changes. Um, one of the things, the questions that I have personally, and this is also dealing with my students, and one is that um, even though Japanese security policy is changing drastically, has the Japanese security identity changed? And it, I would say the answer is not really. And perhaps one of the biggest reason why is because, uh, first of all, in the security strategy, the, the concept of exclusive defense still remains. And so it's really hard to understand how you can make a, great, a, a massive change even though the basic tenet still remains of exclusive defense. And also the Constitution, the, especially Article 9, remains intact. And I think national security identity to a large degree, uh, it can only be changed through revising the most important super law that you have. And Japan really has not been able to do that. And hopefully um, this will happen. Uh, and another thing that, um, that I'm worried about is that do, do we have time? So I think Shida's vision is about five years. But do we actually have five years? And the reason why I raise this is because I guess the big question that we need to ask is, is time on the side of China? Can China take it easy and, and wait for a decade? Because their goal is to overtake the United States. But when I look at China, they have massive problems, demographic problems, of course, Xi Jinping, I mean, he's a human being, you know, he has a lifespan. And so I would say, no, maybe time is not on the side of China, which means that China needs to uh, hurry, step on the gas, rather than you know, stepping on the brake, that, that time is not on their side. So it's a concept that I think that we need to, uh, be, that we need to think about. And finally, I'd like to say that, um, of course, FOIP is inclusive. The door is open for China. But I mean, it's, it's really, China really, I don't think has any incentive to join because of course there, there are four rules based order, but the rules have to be their rules. And more and more we are seeing Russia and China realigning their interests. So I think uh, things are gonna get a lot more dicey in the future. So things will be uh, much more tense next year than this year and the following year will be even more so. So I think when, as we talk about FOIP, we need to be also very cognizant of the hard reality, the hard truth, that these are major powers and we do not see eye to eye on many issues. Thanks, Rory and Chris, um, can you tell us about what uh, Australia and the United States are doing in balancing? What are the one or two important steps that you are taking and uh, what we you know, countries in the region should be doing together? How much time have you got? <laughs> um, look, I'll, um, I'll kick off on, on what Australia is doing and what I think our aspirations are. So, um, you know, I think as most of the audience will know, Australia had a change of government last year. We went from a conservative government to a Labor government, so a more progressive government. And I make that point just to note that in normal circumstances, that would come with the expectation that Australia would actually wind back its focus on defence and national security. You know, you'd have uh, obviously a big focus on uh, social wel welfare, on um, social development, on diplomatic engagement. But fascinatingly, what we've seen is overwhelming continuity in the substance of security policy. But if anything, continuity that is actually doubling down on the substance of security policy, on defence modernise defence modernisation, for example, and. As many of you also know, Australia's gone through a rocky time in our relationship with China in recent years, and I think that's overwhelmingly because of China's coercive activity towards Australia, its influence and interference operations, and the way that Australian pushback actually was read as provocative by China. Um, but now we have a situation where the government is, on the one hand, trying to diplomatically stabilise the relationship with China, so talking with great discipline, being a lot more disciplined than I am right now uh, in what I say and what they say about China. And yet, they're building the big stick. They're talking softly, but building a big stick underneath. It's, it's, it's good statecraft. And that big stick is, and, we, and we'll see more of this, I think, very soon in Australian policy announcements, has um, two sides to it. One is, of course, the, um, actually three sides. So one is the AUKUS um, announcement, the AUKUS program, uh, nuclear-powered submarines for Australia, an enormous departure from our 
um, our traditions and our policies in the past. Uh, that is to make Australia a stronger maritime power to defend our very large maritime interests and to act independently, but also to be part of the deterrent balance in the Indo-Pacific, and that's a, that is a US-led deterrent balance. After all, AUKUS is Australia, the United States, and, 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 and the United Kingdom providing the technology. I uh, know that's a long, a long game. That'll be a, a 20 year plus program. Um, but according to the media reports, we are likely to see um, the capability gap dealt with in the short term, including perhaps according to media reports um, through uh, obtaining uh, some Virginia class submarines from the US before we work trilaterally with the US and UK to build a new class of submarine. It'll be very expensive. It's a big deal, but it just shows how seriously concerned Australians are across the political spectrum about our security environment. The other two points, oh, and I should add, this is, in my view, good for all of Australia's friends and allies in the region. Um, the other two points, Australia is also working in the short term to improve its defence capability. There's a document called the Defence Strategic Review that has been handed to government, a classified document. Uh, a public version of that will be released before the beginning of May, and I anticipate that will include recommendations for significant and rapid improvement to Australian uh, capability in the short term, including strike, uh, including, for example, uh, missiles, uh, including, for example, um, uh, a larger and um, dispersed fleet of relatively small, re relatively small surface combatants in the Australian Navy. Uh, I don't know this, I'm speculating. I think they would be both good ideas. And making Australia more of a maritime power, moving away from the kind of balance we've had in the past where we had a little bit of everything and not much of anything. Um, and finally, uh, it's the partnerships and it's the allies. You know, Australia is not a country that can defend its extensive interests single-handedly. If you look at the size of our territory and the size of our population, big and small, um, we always work with allies and partners. And what's exciting and important for me is that that's not only the United States. Um, it's Japan in particular, but also we're looking at other partners in the region um, India and beyond to ensure that we're really part of uh, a coalition for balance and deterrence and that's where I think a lot of the, um, you know, the really important prospect of Australia continuing to operate in a um, much more effective way with, um, with Japanese forces, the fact that we have now the reciprocal um, access agreement working its way through the systems, the fact that I think we'll see Japanese forces training in Australia uh, and much more besides, I think that all adds to the, um, the ideal Indo-Pacific outcome, which is that among other things, uh, the leadership of the PLA wakes up every morning, looks out at the region and says, not today. Point and uh, actually, when the Chinese government said, uh, we, you know, we are not going to buy uh, wine from Australia anymore, the people in this country were saying, "Whoa, well, we have to buy more <laughs> Australian wine." And uh, you know, my my wife loves wine, right? And uh, she ha she was very happy. She had another reason why she had to buy more wine. <laughs> Chris, sure, thanks. Yeah, I would say there there are basically four. Um, ways in which the U.S. effort to balance China is manifest, at least in the sort of the security space. Number one is through uh, our own capability investments. I mean, China is now clearly delineated in our national defense strategy as the pacing threat, the standard in, against which all U.S. capabilities uh, are evaluated and measured, uh, and the capabilities that we need to have available at a time of crisis uh, are assessed. So one is the, the internal, uh, the internal component at, at DOD. A second is adjustments to U.S. force posture uh, in the region. You can see this in a number of ways: a systematic effort to diversify the locations from which the United States operates militarily in the region. Um, you see an expansion of force posture initiatives in Australia. Uh, adjustments uh, coming in the U.S. Marine Corps presence in Japan uh, and in Okinawa in particular, uh, an expansion of locations in the Philippines recently announced uh, where the United States will have, have access um, going forward, 
and, and a host of other uh, locations in the Pacific Islands and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands uh, where, uh, where the U.S. is also developing infrastructure um, uh, for operations. And all, all of this is about complicating the decision-making calculus in Beijing when it comes to a crisis, right? The more places the U.S. can operate from, the more uncertainty that a potential adversary in Beijing uh, has to deal with. The third is allies. As I alluded to in my, in my remarks, sort of a change in the way the United States thinks about the importance of alliance relationships. It's not just that allies are important and that we love our allies, which of course we do. It's the, it's the conscious recognition that capable allies, powerful allies, are very much in the interest of the United States. So this AUKUS decision that Rory mentioned, it's hard to overstate how significant a decision it was in the United States system to make available nuclear propulsion technology to Australia. That had never been done outside of Britain in 1958. In 1958, <laughs> right. So very significant. And again, based on the idea that a more capable Australia uh, is, is in the United States' interest. I'd say the same thing about Japan, uh, and, the, and specifically in reference to uh, Japan's decision to acquire counter-strike capability. There was a time, not that long ago, when there would have been discomfort in the halls of the Pentagon and at the White House at the prospect of a more capable Japan. And the idea of selling Tomahawk cruise missiles would have been pretty unthinkable not that many years ago, single digit years ago. But again, the idea that a Japan that can strike back on its own is good for the deterrence picture, good for, good for stability um, in the region. Then the last, last dimension of balancing that I would mention is um, the economic one, and in particular the technology component. Um, uh, and I, I think in particular about the decision in October to impose pretty robust export controls on very high-end semiconductors and related technology to China. That reflected a fundamental shift in U.S. thinking about the role of export controls. In the past, the purpose of export controls was to ensure that the United States stays a generation or two ahead of a potential adversary in a critical technology. The, the philosophy behind the measures announced in October was that's not enough. We have to widen the gap at the high end, uh, given the military applications of high end semiconductors. And more of that is coming. So that too is part of the balancing piece, is addressing the technology competition and getting more rigorous uh, about, about how we think about the technologies that need to be controlled. There are some downside risks to that approach that we can talk about but that is very much front and center uh, in Washington these days. All right, thank you very much. So I would like to open the floor for Q&A, but uh, before I do so, um, let me just address one more uh, issue, which is China. Uh, Rory talked about the uh, possibility of incorporating China into the Indo-Pacific, and uh, despite the balloons, uh, China seems to be interested in improving its relations with the U.S. And Japan is certainly, China is an important partner. So what do you think is we can do um, to sort of deal with China, improve relations with China, or even change China? Um, maybe let's start with uh, Chris and then Rory and Tosh. Yeah, I think, um, I think it remains vital to, con to, to pursue, where possible, a cooperative agenda with China. The fact is, of course, there are a variety of areas in which cooperation between the United States and China and really uh, any country in China is vital. When you think about the challenge of climate change, global pandemics, uh, for us, um, drug-related issues, uh, the need for um, uh, communication channels with China is is essential. Um, I will well, say well, that. What lady, about North Korea? Uh, and and I would add, sure, North Korea to that list. The thing that I would offer, and I and I think is the is the challenge before us, 
is, uh, at least from where I sit in Washington, I don't see a lot of receptivity to that agenda uh, in Beijing. Um, and certainly that's what I hear from my friends in the State Department and, and the Department of Defense as well. Uh, there is clearly uh, a desire to put what the administration calls guardrails around the relationship, to, put a, to, to, to stabilize it, to avoid the possibility of unintended incidents uh, spiraling into, into conflict. Um, but it's also true that I think this balloon incident in some ways demonstrates how undeveloped those channels still are. You know, we have a defense hotline with the People's Republic of China, but there's a tendency not on the other side not to pick up the phone in, uh, in the moment. But I, but I do think it is critical, uh, and certainly the, the region expects it of the United States, uh, to seek to cooperate where possible uh, and to do everything that can be done to preserve communication channels that avoid the worst possible outcome. Uh, so that is, that is certainly an important part of the agenda. Well, Rick? Yeah, I would pick up on that point about guardrails and confidence building measures. I mean, we all desperately need those to be stronger with China. And I think the intent uh, from all of our countries is, is, is to strengthen those. It's a choice for the PLA to decide that it's not going to play with risk anymore, that it's actually going to um, make use of these communication channels to prevent incidents, miscalculations and, uh, and, and so forth. Look, more generally on incorporation and China, and I do use in my book the term incorporation to say that there's something we can do with China in the Indo-Pacific that is not accommodation in the sense of basically doing everything China wants um, to adjust the rest of the region to China's needs. You know, there are some scholars in my country who say we should just simply draw a line on the other side of the Taiwan Strait and say that's the new, um, you know, that's, that's the new sphere of influence uh, and sphere of interest. Uh, that's accommodation. But the other side of it is absolute containment. We, we need something between accommodation and containment. And so the idea of incorporation is to say that there's mutual adjustment. China is, if you like, becoming more prominent and active in an Indo-Pacific region where, frankly, a lot of other countries live. Uh, and it's going to have to get used to their interests and their sensitivities just as we pay some respect to, to China's. Now, that may be an impossible dream, uh, the way things have gone in the regional order in recent years. But I think building more convergence and common ground among the various Indo-Pacific policies, as we've talked about today, including with non-Quad countries, with ASEAN, with Europe and so forth, that's actually creating that larger regional body, that larger regional framework that China's going to need to engage with. And I think it's going part way, therefore, to creating a context where China actually can have the conversations without feeling that it's backing down and losing face on every issue. You know, I hear that um, the Chinese now are willing to engage with ASEAN on the ASEAN Indo-Pacific outlook, even though it contains that dreaded word Indo-Pacific uh, that, uh, that the China has rejected. So there's a little bit, there's a little bit of potential there. The Australian bilateral story with China, I think, does hold some lessons for us all because, yes, we have dialogue now, as we should, always should have. It was China that cut off the dialogue, not us. But we're doing this as stabilisation. We're not doing it as a reset or a capitulation or anything like that. We're pursuing mutual respect, but we're doing it from a foundation of national self-respect. And I think that's the kind of foundation that ultimately... Uh, wise heads within China, and there are wise heads in China, it's just that the leadership doesn't always seem to listen to them, um, wise heads in China may yet, um, may yet engage with. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so uh, Rory just mentioned containment, and so if I may infer from uh, George Kennan, um, I think it's really time that we really think about sources of Chinese conduct. So the Chinese are, are they'd like to improve relations, but uh, does this have any permanence? Um, I think China has their own uh, ambitions, their goals. We need to really think about what drives China. Uh, I'm personally thinking that uh, China wants to buy time now because their economy is not doing well. They have a lot of internal problems. And they're also looking at Russia. And if Russia is able to turn around the situation, gain the momentum, then perhaps that's the bus that China wants to ride. Or something can happen in the Middle East. Uh, oh, nothing... Uh, happens there, but, you know, Israel, uh, Iran, 
It's a tinderbox. Uh, if a situation, a major situation arises there, maybe China will see that as a, its own chance to, to move. So I think, um, you know, of course, I don't believe in containing China. Uh, we are economically linked, uh, but we also need to be wary of where China is headed and what it wants. And I don't think necessarily what it wants is what we want. And, uh, and, and Mitchie also talked about Australian wines and whatnot, and that goes about the economic linkages. Um, we're all dependent on China, uh, more or less. You know, we have, there are divergences there, but Japan definitely uh, relies on China for its economic prosperity. Uh, and that's the thing that I think FOIP can add. Um, for example, uh, a recent count, uh, there are 35,000 Japanese companies operating in China. There's 1,500 companies in India. And so that to me, it's, there, there's an imbalance that needs to be uh, rectified. So within the FOIP, within in their large economies within FOIP, perhaps Japan should move some of its eggs into other baskets. You know, just to, just to keep, in, keep in mind Japanese interests uh, and, that, and that China may necessarily uh, not be a friendly partner and it could retaliate using uh, these economic tools. And finally, if I may, um, Akus was mentioned about the submarines. I think those in the audience who are from the Japanese Navy would love to be part of this special Australian-U.S. <laughs> relationship and, and be able to access technology. I know especially the, uh, the submariners in the Japanese Navy are very proud. Uh, and one of the things about nuclear-propelled uh, submarines is I think the fact that when you look at uh, the Indo-Pacific and you look at where Japan is, U.S., and Australia is, these are massive distances. And this is where a nuclear-powered submarine can really make a difference. It's just their ability to travel far in a very stealth manner and the speeds that can, they can travel underwater. It makes this vast body of water that much smaller. So and I'm, not, I'm not advocating for a jockus, but it'd be kind of interesting to see if AUKUS eventually expands to include Japan.